Welcome to Pathagonia. This is Jay. Today we're going to use awesome Kurtz notes to talk about non-neoplastic lesions of the breast. More specifically, reactive and non-proliferative lesions of the breast. This is important because on mammography, it can there can be suspicious findings like cal grouped calcifications or clinical findings on physical exam. And after a biopsy is done, we might find some of these findings that show us that this is not cancer. So let's begin with fibrocystic changes. This is the most common non-proliferative lesions of the breast with no significant increased risk of cancer. So the most common findings you would find are cysts in the terminal duct lobular units. And this is thought to arise from blockage in the ducts upstream and you'll still have an inner epithelial and outer myoepithelial layer, although the epithelial layer can look flattened um, if the cyst is really dilated. Uh, you can have frequent apocrine metaplasia, and cyst walls often contain areas of fibrosis, and you can have calcification as well that can be seen on mammography. So apocrine metaplasia is what we see here. It's a change in the epithelial cells where you'll have round nuclei with one or, or multiple nucleoli. You'll have a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio where the cytoplasm is pink slash eosinophilic and granular. It can sometimes also be papillary and it's oftentimes ER negative and AR positive and sometimes they have fewer myoepithelial cells, but that doesn't mean it is cancer. Inflammatory reactive lesions. So if there are suspicious calcifications on mammography, like you get a biopsy, and that's gonna damage the tissue, and there's gonna be bleeding, and so your body makes a response to that site, that biopsy site. And some of the reactions we can see under the microscope, depending on the time um, the biopsy is taken, are organizing hemorrhage, where the breakdown of blood will lead to hemosiderin deposits and the macrophages will gobble up the hemosiderin. There can also be fat necrosis where the macrophages gobble up the dead adipocytes. Foreign body giant cells can be seen as well as foreign material. Uh, Dr. Shepard here has a picture of suture material um, in the breast tissue. You can have granulation tissue scarring fibrosis, acute and chronic inflammation, and squamous metaplasia. When you get a resection specimen of the breast and you see, and they had a prior biopsy site, do not mistake epithelial displacement for cancer. Uh, when the epithelial fragments are confined to the biopsy site, a diagnosis of epithelial displacement should be favored. Um, a diagnosis of invasive carcinoma should be made only if the epithelium is found in the stroma away from the biopsy site, or if there are other characteristic findings, like uh, cellular atypia, uh, very high mitotic activity, and other findings suggestive of invasive ductal, invasive lobular, uh, as well as other subtypes of carcinoma. Um, we have another video of Kurtz notes on breast carcinomas, so take a look uh, if you have time. We talked about fat necrosis, so let's talk more in depth into it. This can happen after injury, surgery, biopsy, or trauma. I've known someone who got hit by a baseball and they've had um, fat necrosis and it appeared sometimes as a mass clinically. Um, it, but so it can mimic malignancy clinically and or radiographically and microscopically, we'll see cystic spaces surrounded by these lipid-laden macrophages that are gobbling up these dead fat cells. Um, depending on when we sample it, it can have acute and chronic inflammation. The early stage, you'll have hemorrhage, and the late stage will be kind of recovery or repair process where you'll have this fibroblastic proliferation and collagen deposition. talk about reactions to foreign material. So I've seen these a couple of times where 
you have a breast implant that's made out of silicone and there's leakage. And this can be seen even without frank implant rupture. There's just like microscopic leakage. And you'll see oval cystic spaces that appear empty or have amorphous pale material with histiocytes and giant cells. Look at this giant cell where you have more than 10 nuclei all enmeshed in the cytoplasm. It can be present in the capsule or in draining axillary lymph nodes. And then you can have, which is, a, a, personally, it's just fascinating what our body does in terms of adaptations. But if you have a, a breast capsule, a breast implant, sometimes your body will make a capsule, uh, basically a lining over the implant. And you can have this synovial metaplasia. And it's, I, it's essentially identical to synovium. Let's talk about duct ectasia, or also known as periductal mastitis. It's predominantly seen in perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. Uh, clinical symptoms include pain, discharge, mass, or calcifications. And the histologic features include varying amounts of periductal inflammation. As you can see here, we see some lymphocytes, uh, periductal fibrosis, duct dilation, as you can see here, inspissated lipid-rich material with foamy macrophages that often infiltrate the wall, as well as squamous metaplasia. This is one of my favorite breast breast entities in terms of the histologic findings. Um, it's called diabetic mastopathy or lymphocytic mastopathy. And it's typically seen in young to middle-aged women, and most often with type 1 diabetes, but it can be seen in other autoimmune disorders. And it can present with a mass. And the three characteristic findings are, when you look at the stroma, it'll look keloid-like, very dense fibrosis. You'll have periductal, perivascular, and perilobular lymphocytic infiltrate. And you'll also see epithelioid myofibroblasts in the stroma. Epithelioid means you have a nuclei with abundant cytoplasm. And usually the nuclei is in the center or near the center. This is a newly emerge, relatively newly emerging entity, IgG4 related, IgG4 diseases. And one aspect or one presentation is related mastitis and presents as a discrete painless mass. And the classic findings of IgG4 related diseases are a dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Um, here are some lymphocytes. Maybe this is a plasma cell this is a plasma cell, this is a plasma cell. Um, you'll have the storiform pattern of fibrosis and you'll have obliterative plebitis. <coughs> Excuse me. And on immunohistochemistry, to help support this diagnosis of IgG4-related mastitis, you'll have increased IgG4-positive plasma cells. And it's often accompanied by lobular atrophy. <coughs> Excuse me. Last but not least, we'll talk about granulomatous mastitis. It's important to know that granulomas can be seen in a variety of conditions, including sarcoidosis, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, prior biopsy, maybe there's foreign material and your histiocytes are making are responding to it, uh, duct ectasia, there can be some um, inspissation and your histiocytes uh, react to it, and infections where you're also basically all your histiocytes are responding to some entity, whether it be infectious or some flu body fluid that's supposed to be in the stroma, et cetera. So when you see granulomatous mastitis and because you're not sure what the cause is, you, want to, you must do bug stains to rule out infectious etiology. Um, sometimes it can be idiopathic and Kind of tying it into microbiology, carini bacterium can cause a granulomatous infection 
with abundant neutrophils and a central lipid vacuole. And what we see here is these chlorinine bacteria in the lumen with um, mixed inflammation. So this entity is called cystic neutrophilic granulomatous mastitis. All right, so thank you for listening if you made it this far. We talked about non-cancerous breast lesions, although sometimes they can look suspicious on imaging. Um, these include fibrocystic changes, which is due to dilation of the terminal duct lobular units. Um, you can have apocrine metaplasia. We talked about inflammatory and reactive lesions, including your body's response to a biopsy done on your breast. Um, and you can have these hemosiderin or lipid-laden macrophages, foreign body giant cells or foreign material, uh, scarring fibrosis and different amounts of acute chronic inflammation. We talked about fat necrosis, how that can be due to trauma, biopsy surgery, and you'll have these kind of cystic spaces surrounded by lipid-laden or foamy macrophages that are eating the, the dead adipocytes. And depending on the stage, the timing of when this happens, you can have hemorrhage or you can have kind of scar-like fibroblastic proliferation. We talked about reactions to foreign material, especially for uh, patients who've had implants where there can be even a microscopic leakage without any gross rupture. Um, you can have a lining that forms around the implant and can lead to synovial metaplasia. We talked about duct ectasia, where you can have varying amounts of periductal inflammation, fibrosis, duct dilation, inspissated lipid-rich material, as well as squamous metaplasia. We talked about diabetic mastopathy, particularly seen in type 1 diabetics, um, but also seen in other autoimmune disorders in young to middle-aged women, where you have this keloid, very robust um, fibrous stroma. You have these periductal, peri uh, va vascular and perilobular lymphocytic inf um, infiltrates, and you'll have these in the stroma, epithelioid myofibroblasts. We talked about this emerging disease, IgG4-related diseases that can manifest in the breast, um, IgG4-related mastitis, where you'll have this lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. Uh, you'll have this storiform pattern of fibrosis and obliterative plebitis when you can get an uh, IgG4 IHC, which will show increased plasma cells. And then we talked about granulomatous mastitis, how there's an abundance of etiologies, including autoimmune, infectious, foreign body, duct ectasia, um, and how we sh always have to do bug stains to rule out infectious etiology. And one infectious etiology um, is due to carini bacterium and is called cystic neutrophilic granulomatous mastitis. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, we'll catch you on Pathagonia. Bye.